invite uh, my, a few people to join me here on the panel, which is Dr. Carson, Dr. Carter, and Dr. Fowler are all going to come up and join me up here. And as they uh, come up, it's a delight not only to have um, Don Carson uh, up here with us today, but also to have uh, Stan Fowler and Craig Carter. Stan, uh, Dr. Fowler is teaching at uh, Heritage College and Seminary, and uh, Dr. Carter is at uh, Tyndale University and seminary. And um, I'm going to do a bit of a, a, some highlights here. That's what's on my lap. And then I'm going to walk us through some questions that have come my way. But in terms of resources in, in uh, the bookstore, Kevin DeYoung has written a book called Taking God at His Word. It's an outstanding book. I read it a couple of years ago. It's accessible. There's only a couple of copies left. Um, but if you want to order a copy of this book, they'll give it to you at the discounted rate and, um, and they'll mail it to you for free. They'll ship it to you for free. Um, I know this is a book when you and I were going back and forth on email, um, Dr. Carson, that you appreciate. Any comment you want to make about it? It's good. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, it, it has potential for being in this generation what Jim Packer's little book was 60 years ago, Fundamentalism and the Word of God. Uh, it's not... It's not erudite, it's not complicated, it's not long, um, it's, it's a generalist's volume, but it is readable, accessible, uh, helpful for shaping a new generation. Good. And then th this is a book I've read as well, it's, it's by Dr. Carson, it's The Collected Writings on Scripture, it's an outstanding book, covers a variety of topics, and it's worth getting, and, and it again, I think is quite accessible, there's um, some chapters at the end where, uh, where Dr. Carson comments on some other works that are out there that is worth reading, but a number of the chapters earlier on in here are just outstanding. And then another book he's edited. Now, speaking of Kevin DeYoung's being short, this one isn't. Um, it's a bit bigger. I, now, I haven't read this whole book. I've read about 800 pages of it. I'm not done. But that tells you the length of this book. Um, it's edited. There are a number of incredibly helpful chapters in here. And at the end, Dr. Carson actually goes through, I don't remember how many questions, but you might, you might go through 60 questions. I don't know. There's a lot. <laughs> and, and, I just and wrote them. I didn't them count them. On scripture, and they're actually quite helpful. And so these two books, if you're interested, this is more of a resource, I would say. It's not typically one that you read cover to cover, though I have, I'm, in, I'm almost done that, I guess. But it, it's a resource where different chapters in the book reflect on different areas um, that you may come across in trying to understand authority of Scripture and what that looks like. And it's a helpful resource that way. And so um, if you're interested in getting that, you can order it at the bookstore. They'll ship it to you as well. Do you want to comment on either of those books that you've edited? Oh, that book is full of hidden blessings. I mean, you can use it as a doorstop, for example. <laughs> you, you, can, you can use it when you're... When you're uh, getting exercises, it'll, it'll improve your cardiovascular system. <laughs> and, and probably if you want to go to sleep at night, you can use it for that too. Uh, they could. Um, all kinds of blessings. So, uh, so one, if he's doing this, just, my, my truck, I live downtown, and a few weeks ago my truck was broken into. I was away in Myrtle Beach, my son was home, my truck was broken into, and uh, it was sitting in the back seat of the truck and they didn't take it, I don't know why. <laughs> There was not much in the truck. There was probably four dollars and change and whatever. And they wrestled through. They took bungee cords they had in there and a tarp, and they left the book. I, I would have let them have. They could have had my highlights. You have a lower class of criminals here. <laughs> <laughs> so I've I've had some questions that have been sent uh, my way, and then some have written out some. And so we're going to just dialogue. And there's we talked briefly ahead of time, but there's not like a prescription here for who's going to answer what question. So I'm just going to start tossing out questions and then we're going to see who wants to take which one first. But um, the, the first question I'm going to ask is this, are, are the terms inerrant and infallible still useful and how would you define them and in what context would you still use them? Well, yes. I think they're still useful in the sense that if we're, if we're trying to define Uh, we have to explain what that means. 
Well, I think we can say that inerrancy and, and authority of Scripture are very important words, and if we think about what inerrancy means, um, when we talk about Scripture being um, imprecise in certain ways, it is nevertheless as exactly as precise as it needs to be. Um, and this is something that we, we need to build up our understanding of Scripture inductively by reading it and studying it and and comprehending it, and as we do that, we realize that the message that, it, that God is speaking to us in the Scripture is adequately and precisely conveyed in exactly the way that it needs to be conveyed. Sometimes, in order to say it, um, sometimes, as, as Dr. Carson mentioned uh, earlier, sometimes the God dictates things exactly and the prophet writes them down, or he shows the prophet something and the angel says, write this down. And that level of precision is apparently necessary at that point. And it often occurs when there's a lack of understanding, when there's something is happening very foreign to the writer of Scripture's experience, something that the writer of Scripture does not really understand or, or appreciate easily, but it's something foreign and different and new and startling and perhaps not fully comprehensible. Then God needs to specifically guide what is written in a way that is not as important for him to do when he has by providence prepared that scriptural writer through education and background and, and so on to be able to say something that is exactly what God wants to be said, but it isn't as necessary for God to be as precise in, in the way that... So it's all, whether it's by miracle or by, ins, or by providence, what we confess is that the final product is exactly what it needs to be in order for Scripture to function authoritatively in the church and do the things that Paul says it does, to Tim, tells Timothy that it does. Don? Many people want to respond at this juncture and say, if you have to put in all of those explanations and qualifications, why bother still using the word? And the response to that is, that's true of almost every word. How about God? Now, when you and I use it, we may presuppose the God of the Bible, and so with lots of people in the world never use it that way, which is why statements of faith say quite a lot of things about God in order to train up what the Word is about. So, in other words, it's no response against inerrancy that it has to be carefully defined. That's true of all words that are involved in disputation. But in essence, inerrancy, which simply means without error, that's all it means, is a, a way of uh, insisting on the truthfulness of Scripture. That's all it is. Uh, it's not insisting on the precisionism of Scripture or that it has to be done in a certain form of genre. It means where questions of truthfulness are applicable, the Bible is telling the truth. There are some statements in Scripture that are not propositional, and they are not subject to the category of inerrancy. But where a text is subject to the category of inerrancy, the Bible is always telling the truth. That's all that is meant. And that has always been the historic position of the confessing church. It's interesting. 
asserts there is true. Infallible would, would normally convey the idea that there's something qualitatively true of, of it which makes it incapable of, of error. I mean, uh, so in many ways you would think infallible is the stronger term, but in the evangelical debate, uh, as it has developed, let's say, since the mid-1970s, um, inerrant has become the stronger word, and infallible is often used by those who would want to say, the Bible infallibly achieves its purpose of, of leading us to salvation and to uh, the Christian life, forms, right forms of the Christian life, but makes erroneous assertions in some other ways. So I, I always have to ask, with whom am I speaking here, and, and what, what is there in, in your understanding about the term? So we have to define our terms carefully. That's true for all, um, all serious discussion. In many parts of the southern U.S., Calvinist basically means not interested in evangelism. Yeah. In that corner of the world, I don't like to call myself a Calvinist because I am rather interested in evangelism. So you either have to have time to define the word or you find another word. Do you see? So, so a text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. <laughs> Could I just put in a plug here for the idea that uh, we should not, not allow the receptor audience to which we are speaking to do all the defining. Yeah. Uh, we have to say, we, sometimes we have to look back into history and see how words have been used and how they change, but we can't always put everything, we can't express every orthodox doctrine in language that is already known and understood and approved by the culture that we're speaking to necessarily. There may be things that the cult, there may be words that the culture will have to consider using in a different way in order to understand what is the message is. Uh, as long as they don't do that, then they're going to inevitably become confused. So what I'm saying is we don't have to, I use the, you often hear this metaphor of translate uh, Christian truth into a language that is um, comprehensible by secular people. Um, secular people need to learn how to, how to understand the words as they are being used in the Christian tradition. Just as like when you go to university and, and study any subject, you're going to have to learn the vocabulary of how it's commonly used in that subject area in order to understand what is being said. Could I add a footnote to that? Yeah. Um, I agree with that where the words in question are biblical words especially, because it's part of learning to read the Bible. If it tends to be a theological term that has no deep biblical anchoring, I'm a little more flexible. So uh, Tim Keller tells me that in New York City's elite communities, evangelical means roughly Protestant jihadist. And you can get around that by insisting that they uh, that they have got to learn what evangelical means. And I would say that in that case, yeah, you, you better go at it because evangelical, euangelion, is, is bound up with what the gospel really is. On the other hand, it's not for nothing that we called it the gospel coalition rather than the evangelical coalition. Right. Nobody knows what gospel means, but at least they don't think that it means Protestant jihadist. Right. So you want to preserve gospel, evangelical, euangelion, because that's a biblical category. You cannot lose that without losing something um, intrinsic. I, I'm going to transition us. That's great. And um, one of the questions that came our way is this morning, Dr. Carson talked a bit about different genres of scripture. And so if I'm an untrained, you know, just, just person here, congregate who loves to read the word, how do I understand the genre of scripture I'm, I'm in and, and what that should do in terms of, of, of God speaking to me and what that looks like? How do I understand the different genres? And are there any resources I can look to that might help me with that? Well, um, don't make it more difficult than it is. Uh, all of us are familiar with different literary genres to some extent. Um, if you're reading a computer manual, you don't interpret it quite the same way as you would reading a book of limericks. At least I hope not. Um, and you don't read a book of limericks the same way you'd read a love letter or a love email nowadays or a love Instagram. Um, 
so, so, so the, the, we're, we're familiar with, with, uh, with, with hyperbole and so on already. Oh, boy, it took me a year to get here today. It was, traffic was abominable. Nobody thinks it's a literal year. No, nobody would say that was an untrue statement. Uh, because you, you've, made, you've made allowances already for, for, for a different literary genre, in this case a, a genre including a figure of speech that we call hyperbole. So uh, almost everybody has picked up some mix of figures of speech and have learned to, to flex already. The Bible has some literary genres with which we're not deeply familiar, like apocalyptic which is one of the reasons it's sometimes subjected to the most screwball interpretations imaginable. But nobody writes apocalyptic. Um, a friend of mine was passing away free New Testaments on the, a British university campus a few years ago. And uh, he passed one out to uh, a, a chap who had never read anything of the Bible. And uh, some months later he asked him, hey, did you read that book I gave you? Yeah, he said, it's a bit... It's, it's a bit troubling at the front end. It keeps telling the same story three or four times. But I sure like that science fiction at the end. And you, you can see what he's trying to do. He's, he's trying to, to tag it with a literary category that he does know something about. It's not science fiction. But on the other hand, it reflects an intrinsic effort to make the imaginative jump that enables you to understand it, you know. So a, a, a Bible reader, even if not trained, eventually begins to see through how the literary genres work, you see. You may not be taught a course on wisdom literature, but you read Proverbs long enough and you manage to pick up some of the ideas of how a proverb works, you, you know. And, and so it's helpful to read some books that talk about these kinds of things. Uh, I don't like every part of it, but there's a, a, a book that's, that's still worth reading today called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth that deals with some important issues of literary genre. Uh, for those of you who are older, uh, Bernard Ram's Protestant Biblical Interpretation has some stuff on literary genre that's still worth looking at, uh, though some of it's pretty dated. There's a series of books published by Zondervan on how to read the Psalms, how to read Proverbs, how to read, you know, and again, it's got some good stuff in it. So there are some helps around, and, and uh, you, you know, a, a pastor like Dwayne Klein would be glad to give you a list of books. <laughs> Oh, I've, I've told you a million times not to use that hyperbole. Um, my, my experience, uh, especially in, in my 13 years of pastoral ministry, tells me that people, people do understand that, that we communicate in diverse ways. We use all sorts of figures of speech, and, and the phone book isn't written the same way as a book of poetry or a novel. But... But those of us who have responsibility for teaching at the church do need to help people think that through. And I, I mean, I still remember the time um, I, was, I was teaching a Bible class in, in the first church I served as a pastor. And, and, I was, and I said, for example, Proverbs are true generalizations. That's what they are. They aren't mathematical formulas. And so I said, uh, Proverbs 15.1, for example, says a gentle answer turns away anger. But that's, that's not a promise that on every occasion when someone speaks to you in anger and you respond gently that that person will cease to be angry. And a, and a guy sitting in the class said, yeah, Solomon didn't seem to know my wife. <laughs> and, and she was sitting beside him, which made it a whole lot more awkward. Um, but sometimes people, they don't instantly warm up to it. And in that same church, I once said, uh, God's promise through Jeremiah in the New Covenant is, I, I will I'll forgive their sins, I will not remember them anymore. And, and one brother raised his hand and said, Pastor, if the Bible says God forgets our sin, he, he forgets. He was the church treasurer, too, which caused me some concern. <laughs> but so, I mean, I tried to help him and the group understand you, you can't very well believe all the Bible says about God and believe that he literally forgets. You won't be able to bring every work into judgment if that's true. But, but people do need to be helped. But, but they, they are capable of receiving that teaching, in my experience. Can I just say one thing about genre is that uh, sometimes people say, I don't take Genesis literally. And what they mean is, 
I don't believe what that portion of Scripture says. Um, and the problem of, we're always looking for the literal meaning of the text. We want to know what it says. And just because a text is poetic does not mean that it is, is not conveying anything that can be formulated into a proposition. In fact, poetry is more precise language than, than prose in many ways. Um, but the point is that, that just saying that such and such a text of scripture is of such and such a genre, particularly that pointing out that it uses a figure of speech or pointing out that it's poetic in nature, um, does not mean that that text of scripture doesn't say anything and doesn't mean anything, and that, that it isn't possible to disbelieve it. It just means you need to understand what is being said in that text in the right way, taking account of the genre that, that is being used. And so, um, the, the idea of recognizing different genres in Scripture is not a way of dodging the meaning of the Scriptures or saying in a polite way that we don't take them seriously. It's, uh, it's one thing to take the Bible literally, it's another thing to take it seriously. And in truth, nobody takes everything in the Bible literally. And, um, and, and because, the, but the goal should be to take what is literal, take take literally what is intended literally and what is not intended literally, not to take that literally. That's the goal of good Bible interpretation. So, so, so I think that's a, that's a great segue. And uh, Dr. Carson mentioned a couple of books. One of them was by Stuart and Free and Stuart and Fee, How to Read the Bible for Everything It's Worth. A few years later, probably a couple of decades later, they wrote another book um, called How to Read the Bible Book by Book. And it's, it's actually an excellent resource as well for this. Uh, but somebody wrote in and said, um, help me understand the use. Now, they use the term anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic language. I probably more use the term accommodation. But how do we understand accommodation or anthropomorphic language? And when is that being used in scripture? How do we understand when that's happening? So first, we may need to take a moment and just define what those terms mean. And then talk about how do we, when we see that in scripture, what does that mean for us? And how do we understand that? So... Well, anthropomorphism is, is describing God in terms of human bodily form. The hand of God, the eyes of God, um, God's arm, etc. Um, a related term, often, sometimes not, ex well, sometimes identified this way, anthropopathism would be describing God um, in terms of human emotional experiences, uh, which the speaker may or may not intend. Uh, to be understood straightforwardly. So that's a, that's a bit of, I think, the, the basics of the terms. And when we see them in scripture, how do we understand them, or how do we understand even, like in terms of another term, accommodation, and what that looks like? Well, all human language is human. Well, it Amen, is. Amen, brother. It is. <laughs> Preach it. I, I mean, all human language derives from our experience, right? We, we are finite creatures, and as a race, we've accumulated experience, and we, we know the world that we live in, the material world. We, our language reflects our experience of reality. So our language will never be sufficient to contain the reality that is God. It will never be able to express God's being fully. That is not to say that it can't express it truly. It can, up to a point, express it truly. So the, so. In theology, we have something called the doctrine of analogy, where we say that language is ana analogical. That means that if it was univocal, that would be one alternative, then it would mean that if I'm a father and God's a father, then, then fa the word father would be univocal. That would mean that fatherhood for God was the same as fatherhood for a human being. And so then if, if, you, if you heard that God the Father had a son, you'd say, well, naturally, who's his wife? Because if everything that's true of human fatherhood is true of divine fatherhood, then you must have a wife. On the other hand, if the uh, language could be equivocal, and that would mean that, that when you would use a word of God, it doesn't have anything in common with what you, how you use the word of human beings. And so the fatherhood of God would mean something completely and totally different than the fatherhood uh, for a human being. Analogical goes down the middle and says, well, it's neither one or the other extreme. There is a point at which the word that we use of God, and this is true of all the words in the Bible, uh, of all the words in theology, there's a sense in which the word 
does reflect something of the truth about God. There's a point at which it does, but there are many more ways in which that word does not reflect the truth. Um, in other words, there are, there are analogies that we can develop between humans and God because we're made in his image and we're endowed with certain gifts like rationality, but there are limits. And so anthropomorphic language is a, is a good example of how lang human language is used of God, but it has limits. So when you talk about the arm of God, the arm of Yahweh being sufficient to save, um, that's reference to God's power. And, and it's true that God is powerful, and God is more powerful than the gods of Egypt, and he can humiliate Pharaoh and the gods in the Red Sea. And, and it's true to say that his right arm delivered Israel, and right arm there being a reference to his power. So the language is fit for purpose, it does work, but you can't, you, you, you can't say that, that God has an arm in exactly the same way that a human being has an arm. You can't say that the arm is a literal arm on a literal body. Um, so there's, so, so I, I think, the, I think the, the problem of anthropomorphism, to make a long answer short, is simply the problem of human language in general to, when I'm speaking about God. And there is human perversity added on top. Um, this whole discussion that has just been ably summarized is often called the doctrine of accommodation. Uh, Calvin has long, long sections on uh, accommodation, how God accommodates himself to human speech so that, so that we can understand him at least in part. God himself cannot give us omniscient knowledge because omniscience is an attribute of God alone. He can't do a dump and enable us to, explain, to understand everything as he understands everything. We're finite. We cannot take it. So that inevitably, the language that he uses is accommodated to our ears, to our speech, and so on. So, uh, Christians have said things like that for countless centuries. The problem is that in the last century, century and a half, people on the liberal side of things have hidden behind the doctrine of accommodation so that at the end of the day, they don't want to claim that they can say anything really, truly about God. Oh, that's just the language of accommodation. Oh, that's just, everything's just the language of accommodation, which in their use basically means we can't really know anything about God. God is just mysterious. So you end up having a transcendent, mysterious God about whom you can say nothing and then call that worship. And that's just going way too far. So usually it's evangelicals with a high view of Scripture and a deep grasp of the material principle who actually have the most sophisticated doctrine of accommodation. That is, they want people to be warned against the errors on both sides of the camp, uh, the kinds of, of things that um, uh, have, have just been articulated. Um, if God lays bare his arm, uh, we are not to presuppose that he has a literal arm or that he's wearing clothes. Um, but we know what it means. He lays bare his arm. He's, he's shuffing off his coat so that he can use all of his power to do whatever he's going to do. Well, I've just used another one, shucking off his coat. Do you, do, you, do you see? But we know what is meant by that. It doesn't mean, therefore, we cannot say anything about whether or not God's got arms or how much power he's got. So the doctrine of accommodation is important and it's useful to explain and, and unpack some forms of Scripture. But boy, don't, don't let people terrorize you with the notion that you can't say or know anything about God uh, just because the argument is, is, the language is analogical. There's a difference between um, accommodation to human language and forms of expression on the one hand and accommodation to um, human erroneous assertions. That's true. On, on the other. Now, I, I do think we need to recognize that at, at I mean, at some points, um, Writers of scripture may, they may use words that point to ideas that they might have believed that are not true, but they aren't intending to assert those. For example, um, if, if David talks about the sun rising in the east and going across the sky, if they, if they speak about movements of the sun and the moon, etc., uh, they probably in their mind might have been thinking of a, a geocentric universe and the sun moving around the earth 
but they aren't intending to make a point about astronomy. They're simply using the language of appearance. And while, so it doesn't mean that everything the biblical writers might have believed is true. It means whatever they intend to assert is true. Could, could I do a follow-up on that one? Yes, I love this, this one. I was about 10, and we were living in Drummondville at the time, Drummondville, dans les cantons de l'Est, in the eastern townships. And my father was sitting in the armchair reading the Montreal Star. And uh, there, there he was reading a letter to the editor, which was bemoaning all these stupid Christians who actually think the Bible is true uh, when it speaks of the sun rising, and everybody knows the sun doesn't rise. Uh, he waxed uh, very enthusiastic in his disdain for Christians and so on. And Dad looked over the top of the newspaper at me and said, what do you think of that, Don? Well, I don't know. He turned to the front page. Sunrise, 543. <laughs> in other words, phenomenological language is found in every culture. Oh, that was a great, great comment. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition to some practical questions that, that came our way. And one of them is basically, you know, I, I've, got, I've got some kids at home, teenager and younger kids. Um, how do I help them to learn to treasure God's Word, both at a younger age and a teenage age? And specifically for my teenagers, how do I help them to understand its authoritative nature? Be part of a good church. That's not meant to be a smart mouth comment. Um, it really is important because it constitutes a body of brothers and sisters who are modeling things and working with things and who have older teenagers or teenagers have gone through the system. And they've often given a little more thought to Sunday school classes and so on. I remember at one stage, my daughter was uh, listening to a teacher uh, in her high school um, uh, making all sorts of really snide comments about the Puritans and, and so on. Things that were historically nonsense and so on, but in order to, to, to mock their morals and their integrity and, and tag them all with witch burning and the, the whole bit. But it just so happened at that time in our church we had uh, a, a guy who was teaching her Sunday school class who did a whole series for about six months uh, on the Puritans. And she would go in there and argue with her teacher every day. And that was good for her, rather than it being suppressed or, or, or ignored or, you know, he was a competent man who knew the sources and getting the kids to read the literature. I'm not saying that our church always did wonderful things like that, but that was gold. Go, Jim. That was gold. I'll, I'll let Stan and Craig go, but just that reminded me of, um, my brother and I are really different and uh, I, I would always read at night. He hated reading. He hated school. I loved school. My parents say I would cry. We grew up in the country. I would, I would cry when the bus uh, wouldn't come and he would be elated. Um, and uh, when he was 17, God saved him. And he has three trades. And I can remember after God saved him, um, my brother who hated reading, who had to get up to drive to Burlington to his work every day, would make sure he was up 45 minutes early. He would sit at our dining room table and uh, he would just have his Bible out and he'd have this, this um, binder and he would just write out the passage, like the first passage you talked about this morning, and, um, and he'd have a study Bible, and he would just be asking God to teach him things. And he started that habit at 17, and he's 43 now, and he still does that to this day. And though he's never had any formal training, I know few people that can teach the Bible as well as he can in a, in a Sunday school class. And he's modeled that to so many people who would say, you know, I'm not a reader. He would say, neither am I. If you asked him how many books he read this year, he'd say, one, the Bible. That's it. Occasionally he'll read something else, but not, not often. And he just said, God has saved me. This is his word. I've just got to dig in. And he's shown that to his four kids. Stan, Craig? Well, I was just going to say, um, I mean, beyond the obvious of actually taking the time to, to read scripture with the kids, our kids, to talk with them about what it means, um, both in formal and informal settings, um, musing about it while traveling in the car and so on. Surely we teach uh, volumes by example, and, and so it's maybe especially with kids and the teenagers, 
having honest conversations with the kids about what Scripture calls us to do and then talking about how we are doing our best to make that work out in practice um, to, and to be open about the challenges of it, uh, to be open about the challenges of how do I uh, keep myself from sexual temptation? How do I obey God's commands to be generous with, uh, with what he's given us? Um, I, sometimes it's, uh, my, my, my youngest child is almost 40 years old, so it's been a while um, since I had teenagers at home, but now I'm into talking sometimes with grandchildren about it including my oldest granddaughter who's just started university 30 minutes away from us. And it's interesting to see those conversations develop as we talk honestly about what scripture teaches and um, how, how that's, how I've been called to work that out in practice, admitting my failures along the way. Craig, anything you wanna add? No, that's okay. Um, I'll say this in the next question. One thing we found helpful in our home is when they're young, we read the Bible to our kids. Then we read the Bible with our kids, them and us together. Then they read the Bible to us as they get a bit older. And then we move to the place where we're asking them questions about what God's been teaching them through the Word as they're reading, trying to cultivate their own devotional life. And that's been helpful for us. Um, someone asked, how do we interact with other people who are believers or claim to be believers who've redefined authority and have done so in a way, seemingly, so that they can do what they want and believe what they want? Um, at what point does that redefinition of authority bring them to the point where they're not sound in doctrine anymore or possibly even heretical? Where is the line of heresy? And what do we do as we're engaging with Christians that are leaning in that direction? I'm glad I'm asking the questions, to be honest. Yeah, that's obviously a challenging one. Um, we have to carry on a lot of painful and awkward conversations with people who claim to be believers, but, uh, but who appear to be drifting away in their, their refusal to to accept its teaching because it doesn't fit the lifestyle they personally they may want or are living or doesn't mesh with the wider culture which is always exerting its pressure. Um, I think ultimately we have to somewhere start by saying, well, if you profess to be a disciple of Jesus then and, and you affirm him as Lord, then you're going to have to accept his understanding, his attitude towards scripture. So. Can we talk about what that obviously is? And, and if we start the conversation there and say, you know, if, if Jesus could quote scripture and say, it is written, clearly assuming that what is written there is true, then how can we take any other approach to it? That I think is the starting point to, to start with the attitude of Christ towards scripture. <clears throat> Well, the phenomenon of evangelicals um, accepting same-sex marriage these days is an interesting one to observe. There are people who have grown up within the evangelical uh, church, and they, they have um, switched their, their view to adopt the, the modern um, cultural understanding that uh, homosexuality is just fine and so on. And, and, but they want to continue to believe, be evangelicals, they want to continue to profess to believe in Christ, and they want to profess to believe in the authority of Scripture. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about this is that the, the degree of um, biblical literacy is low today. Most people don't know their Bibles very well, and most people are not used to engaging in, in doctrinal oral, or ethical questions using scripture and so many people are easily led astray and some of the the um, the arguments that are used are so shallow and so weak that it's astonishing that anyone could ever accept them to me it seems to me to be astonishing and so I have to ask why is that and I think that in many cases the problem 
stems from a lack of knowledge of the scriptures, a lack of understanding of the scriptures. Um, but there are other issues um, that play into this. We have to be very careful, those of us who preach and teach the word, because um, we have to be careful about how we, how we handle the word. Um, I had a, a call from a youth pastor who was a former student of mine, and he, was, he wanted to tell me about an incident that happened recently. And he said, you know, um, because in my class, I, I, when I'm talking about egalitarian, and comp egalitarian versus complementarian debates, I, I say that I, I do believe that some people uh, on both sides sincerely believe their view to be the teaching of Scripture. It's a little hard for the egalitarian side to say that when the church only, you know, was wrong for 1900 years or so and, then, and, 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 and their view is so new. It's difficult to argue that, but it's still possible to argue that that the church just was wrong all this time and now we see it. Um, however, we need, we need to be careful, and, and this is for people on both sides of the issue, not to appear to be making the Bible say whatever we want it to say. And by appear in that sentence, what I mean is when we preach, people can get the impression that we aren't really basing what we say on Scripture. We're basing it on the cultural pressure to do what we want. We're doing what the culture wants us to do, and we're just basically putting on hold the exegesis of Scripture, and we're going to do it later and figure out a way to justify it later, but we haven't got it figured out yet. Meanwhile, we're proceeding with conforming to the culture. This is very dangerous because when that happens, the next thing that happens on the next issue, if people become